My name is uh, James Jenkin, and I'm the uh, director of Printed Matter. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation today, which is about the possibilities of the artist book. Um, we're obviously really excited to be asked to put together a presentation uh, for this forum. Um, so, of course, we'd like to start by thanking the fair for allowing us to be part of this. Um, I also uh, don't get the opportunity very much to thank the fair generally. They, they've been a really long-term supporter of Printed Matter, and in fact, it's almost 10 years that Printed Matter has been coming to the fair, and that's obviously a great testament to the generosity of the fair management, but I also think it's pretty cool that um, notwithstanding the growth in the gallery system over the decade, that there's still room for non-profits to be part of this forum, and it's wonderful that the, the fair does acknowledge that, so, so we want to say thank you to them. Um, so in terms of talking about the possibilities of artist books, we could probably talk about that till the cows come home at Printed Matter. And, I was a little bit nervous that with so much going on out there and sort of 4,000 artists on the wall that um, you know, people wouldn't have the time to come and talk and, and listen to what is probably a far more modest, I suppose, and um, humble form of art, namely book art. But it's lovely that there are indeed some book nerds around the fair, so <laughs> thank you for coming out. And in return for your time that you've given us being here today with so much going on, I can guarantee that um, it'll be worth it because we have a terrific uh, speaker today. And my only job in this is actually to introduce him. And the reason why I wanted to come up and make sure that I did is knowing this guy as well as I do, he's one of the most modest people you'll ever met. And if he was left to his own devices to introduce himself, he would mumble his name, which is uh, Max Sherman, and then he would very pragmatically and earnestly get on with the talk. And he wouldn't in any way let you know or hint about his accomplishments and why he's actually here today. So I'm going to do that for him. Um, Max is, in my mind, one of the sort of probably top handful of experts in um, artist books in the world. And the reason why I say that is his knowledge is unlike many, and I'm not being disrespectful to many, but of course it's incredibly valuable, but it's not learned or studied. It's, it's really first-hand experience for over 25 years supporting artists who make publications. So Printed Matter um, luckily hired um, Max 25 years ago, and he's been involved since then. And just to put it in context, um, at the heart of Printed Matter, as many of you might know, is, is still today an open submission process. So artists from all around the world send their books to us and we review them and we try to take as many as possible and, uh, and then we sell them on their behalf and trying to return as much of the proceeds as possible to the artists. And at any given point in time, there's about 15,000 to 18,000 titles. So I did some sort of really bad math, but taking into account how long he has been here and how many books have been in inventory and printed matter, this guy has probably reviewed and helped disseminate over a quarter million artist books. And I don't think there's too many people around who, who have does, done that. But on top of that, printed matter is also about programming, you know, um, allowing artists the opportunity to use our space. We have this belief if your book is good enough to be in the store, you should be able to use this space to, to showcase it. And, We've done a huge amount of programming over the years that Max has been involved with. Um, and then over the course of his period at, um, at Printed Matter, he's also curated a number of his, num his own shows. And some of them have been quite incredible, including kind of early surveys of Jenny Holtz's multiples. Um, a wonderful show I wish I had seen called um, By Any Means Necessary, which was a pre-internet day, pre-print on the man show about democratic access to printing and photographs, um, uh, photocopy shows. Um, work, which is a show about how to overthrow the labour system of the world today. And then most recently, a fantastic show, which I did get the privilege to see, a, a survey of the Colab Group in New York, which was active between the mid-70s and the mid-80s and beyond. And that's actually a book now that, um, that, uh, that Max is editing. Um, and lastly, of course, the show that uh, Max has curated uh, most recently is here today, which is um, a survey of printed matter and our history, the surviving history after the flood that we sustain. And that's uh, over in the other hall if anyone wants to see it. So as well as being a kind of a, um, accomplished curator, the, the, the last thing I really want to say about Max and his passion for artist books is that what strikes me about it every day that I work with him is that, of course, it's driven by the love of the artwork on the page, which I think we all love, but it's also driven by this really fundamental and genuine belief in artist books as a democratic object that's uh, enabled accessibility to a lot of people to own art. And Max embodies that in terms of the way he approaches his work. He embodies it in his art, own art practice. He's a very accomplished artist in his own right. Um, but uh, he also embodies that in spirit as a person. So he, he's a terrific guy. So with no further ado, I'll pass you on to my esteemed colleague and, um, and uh, fearless artist book advocate, Max Schumann. Thanks, James. I got a thing over oh, here. <laughs> 
How's it going? Can you hear me? I've got a headset on. I'm half cyborg today, so look out. Um, okay, so the name of this talk is, is going to be called The Possibilities of, of the Artist Book. And um, I'm going to digress for a second and show off. Um, the, I, I, I took the name, actually, from a, a project uh, put together by some wonderful uh, Israeli curators. Uh, it's a project called The Possibility of a Book. And they organized a, a conference in Tel Aviv on, on publishing. And it was about experimental artists and literary publishing, but then it also covered the field of publishing at large. And it was called um, uh, The Publishing Impulse. And at that conference, uh, a leading Israeli public intellectual whose name I can't remember, who was a real, um, I guess you'd call it like a digital utopian, a techno utopian. He very forcefully proclaimed that the book is dead and uh, that we are currently in an era of free and open technological digital communication back and forth and, um, and that the book has been consigned to the dumpster of history and that uh, those who still you know, are interested in books, um, are dinosaurs, and that um, the book's only relevance is as a, uh, an artifact or a kind of novelty item. And I guess in this talk, I'm going to, the thesis of the talk is going to be in trying to uh, argue the exact opposite, that the book is very much alive, that it's part of a kind of interrelated media environment um, and has a real important uh, social, cultural kind of place and, and, and and still a project to be fulfilled, I guess I'd say. Um, um, after uh, the conference in Tel Aviv, I actually went to uh, the West Bank. I visited the West Bank, and I gave a few talks there and visited with some Palestinian artists and uh, invited a young artist couple, um, Ruan Abu Ram and Basil Abbas, to make an a, a, a artist pamphlet as part of a, a publishing series that Printed Matter is doing called Artists and Activists, where we invite artists to make a, a political activist, um, well, in a very large interpretation, artist booklet, and that then we disseminate for free. It was funded by the Gesso Foundation, and we could give them away for free. And they produced this really great uh, pamphlet called The Zone, Desire and Disaster in the Contemporary Palestinian Landscape. And we had 1,000 copies made, and they were shipped to us, and we had only disseminated about you know, a few uh, uh, modest stacks of them before Hurricane Sandy hit us and the entire stash, the remaining thousand were in the basement. Uh, the 500, half the edition that was supposed to go to the artist was completely wiped out. We have one archival copy left. Um, the book doesn't exist anymore. So that's my segue into saying to learn more about the, 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 the Sandy hurricane and, and the surviving history of printed matter, you can go to the exhibit that we have over on the other side of the courtyard and Hall 2.1, 2.0, 1.2, one of those hallways. Anyway, um, um, so now I'm going to go back to talking. To, I'm going to go back to the talk. I'm going to go back to talking about what the talk's going to be about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about printed matter and what we do, kind of, and fo try to fold that into the kind of question of what is an artist's book and what an artist's book can be, the possibilities of the artist's book. Um, um, and uh, I guess the general, uh, I, I kind of want to focus specifically on, you know, the, the, the artist book as an experimental art media practice, both kind of in its origins and in the, in the origins of the contemporary artist book and its development, but also really very much in the present. We think of the book as now this old archaic kind of form, and I'm going to argue that it's very much alive and very much part of the contemporary landscape and information, information landscape as well. Um, and I'm going to blab for a while, so we can just gaze at the. It's going to be a show and tell slideshow. I'm going to show you a bunch of artist book examples in a bit, but um, we'll start. You're just going to have to gaze at the beautiful picture of Printed Matter storefront. The installation in the window is by David Court and um, Josh Thorpe, and it's uh, it's called On Printed Matter. It's a really interesting project they did, um, where they interviewed. Um, several different kind of architect people interested in architecture, including Mark Kryanoff, who designed the inside of the space, Dan Graham, among others. And they interviewed them, and then they took excerpts of interviews with about five different people, and they melded them into a single text piece. And the interviews were specifically about the interior of printed matter, and then the architectural exterior, the, the, 
the, the, the, the architecture of the blocks surrounding printed matter. And then they have one text facing inside, one text facing outside. Um, so you can contemplate that while I, while I talk further. And then we'll get to the exciting slide show and tell in a bit. Um, so um, Printed Matter is a nonprofit arts organization founded in 1976 and we're probably the leading you know, resource in, um, in the world for artist books and related publications by artists. And Printed Matter was really founded in response to this growing phenomena of the contemporary artist book um, and the need for an organization that would help these artists disseminate and get them out into the, um, into the public. Um, so right off the bat, it's the question is, what is an artist book? And for those of you who are well-versed, I see some of you are practitioners for many decades sitting here in the audience. But you know, I encounter still in, in my professional and personal life people who are completely immersed in contemporary art and who still do not have a general grasp of the difference between artist book and art book. Um, so, and I've encountered some of those people in the last couple of days. So uh, if you are, if this is familiar territory, bear with me. It'll also be fun to review some of the fundamentals, I hope. Um, uh, so um, as far as this definition thing goes, is there's obviously many communities, you know, many, um, many different practices, many different definitions of what an artist book is uh, uh, floating around. And obviously, art and the book are related in history all the way back to the beginning of bookmaking, to the beginning of language, with you know, hieroglyphics and different kind of forms of pictograms, which are a form of communication, but also a form of expression. Maybe those are the, you know, the, the precedents for, for artist books, or illuminated manuscripts, which you know, the, you know, are, are just amazing you know, book objects. And then, of course, the whole you know, development of the craft of bookmaking, and culminating probably in Livre d'Artiste productions, which really were more conventional in content and also were really produced specifically for a marketplace and whose reproducibility, whose, uh, whose was the edition size is really linked to its, to its scarcity by making them limited editions. And they were really produced specifically for creating value, additional value in the commercial art market. Um, and whose contents, again, were for the most part very conventional, getting a famous artist like Picasso or Chagall, teaming with a famous literary personality and having them illustrate the stories or the poems, et cetera. But um, it's really in the post-war period, and especially in the 60s and 70s, that we see a break from these more conventional modes of bookmaking or art bookmaking or book arts making. And uh, the artists start dealing with um, kind of all the aspects of the book, both you know the, the, the form, the book is vehicle, the book is concept, um, really the totality of the book as their artwork. And in one way, in a broad sense, as you can think of the simple differentiation is conventional art book is a book about art, artist book is the book is the art. Um, but at Printed Matter, of course, um, our interest is in the artist book is multiple, as in a reproducible form that can be broadly you know, produced, disseminated, circulated, what have you. Um, um, also, I'd say there's a, a printed matter is we really try to have as broad and flexible a kind of idea of what an artist book can be. So um, in our inventory, you'll find, for example, uh, you know, image books, image-based books, uh, uh, pictorial narratives, um, conceptual text-based works, minimalist works, diagrammatic works, scores for audio art or performative works, um, concrete poetry, visual writing, um, theoretical writings by artists who kind of consider their pedagogical, pedagogical work as part of their artistic practice, um, artist writings, artist interviews, um, exhibition catalogs, not conventional ones, which are documentations or even promotion pieces, but conceptual ones like the Seth Seek Lab catalogs, which documented pieces that didn't exist, and therefore the documentation becomes a form of the work itself. Um, and you'll also, in printed matter, I think is in our origins, as we kind of had a, a kind of much more closer alliance with the kind of conceptual minimalist uh, um, output of artist books happening within that experimental community in New York. But then since then, I think is that we've had a much broader and inclusive definition, and you'll find uh, works at printed matter coming from artists coming from just about every discipline um, and area you can imagine. So there's you know, painters, sculptors, installation artists, photographers, traditional book artists. There's artists whose focus is printmaking, illustration, film and video, performance, audio art, choreography and dance, architecture, urban design. All these people, uh, many of the people coming from these different areas are actually making artist books that you'll find at 
um, printed matter. Um, so back to the book itself. Shoot, I need my bag. I brought a visual aid here. Hang on a second. Um, so I can have a, a physical example to show you. Um, this is real fiction by Helen Douglas and Telfer Stokes. And um, um, so, so what was it you know, in the 1960s and 70s that kind of caused the sudden interest and outpouring of, you know, in the book? And, and I think just that we should just remember the broader kind of social political context. 60s and 70s, of course, was a time of great social and political upheaval and protest. Um, um, it also was a, a moment of, of extreme experimentation in the arts, um, where there's this radical break from the object towards concept and process, um, uh, and of a general kind of dematerialization of the art object and conventional forms of art. And the book, uh, many of the artists were working within these areas of experimentation who realized that the book really worked within these different, you know, as a media, you know, practice within these, you know, considering these other kinds of, you know, uh, 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 experimental practices. Um, and I think that if I break it kind of roughly down, the book offers us so many different possibilities for experimentation. And I want to break it down into two basic areas, a formal, kind of the formal possibilities and then the kind of social and political ones. And so, first of all, you have the book, and it's, you know, it's an object. It's a, it's a solid, three-dimensional sculpture, in a way, you could almost say. Um, but, and it has an architecture. It has a structure. Um, it sits in three-dimensional space. It has a mechanics, because it has movable parts and such. Um, it's also kinetic art, because it moves once again. Um, and it's also performative, and of course, it's interactive. It's you have to, the viewer has to actually touch it and turn it and work those mechanics of it for the piece to take its effect. Um, and of course, then it's also multi-dimensional. It's not a two-dimensional thing sitting on the wall. Um, it's not a three-dimensional static object sitting in the middle of the room that you can walk around. It's a multi-dimensional you know, space with multiple surfaces that can be combined to different effects and the work can be deployed over this entire space. And that is where the kind of infinite kind of formal possibilities lie in all these different you know, aspects of the book, I would say. Um, of course, it's also rich in, in its cultural associations. The book is like this, you know, whatever. It's especially, whatever, I guess I should say, probably especially in, in the West, the, the book is like such a, such a whatever, iconic, canonic, whatever kind of thing. It's, it's you know, connotes history, literature, record keeping, diaries, journal, journals. It's a vehicle for information. It's about news. It's about propaganda. Um, so it's rich in, in its different kind of, you know, uh, associations, um, which again, artists can play off of and adds this whole other level of, 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 of area to, to address. Um, but also it's a form of public art and because uh, you can print a thousand copies of it and so you can have an audience of potentially a thousand people. Um, but the difference between the book as a piece of public art and your conventional forms of public art, whereas your statue in front of Rockefeller Center or your you know, big artist billboard, everyone is viewing it within the same, you know, kind of architectural, ideological space or pop culture, the ultimate, you know, uh, 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 stadium architecture where you see concerts and rock concerts and everything like that. And the crowd is drawn into the, you know, a, a, a unison, you know, you know, kind of frenzy and stuff like that is the book is you have a complete, you experience it. You don't read books in mass. You read them individually. You read them within your own you know, within your own surrounding, within your own context, within your own time frame. Um, and that was something that I think is profoundly important to artists is that it, 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 uh, it, 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 it you know, it's, it's part of that avant-garde uh, 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 progression towards the art as personal, the art as everyday, to take it off the pedestal out of the museum and, and enter it and fold it into everyday life, into our common experiences. Um, um, and the book, in its kind of ubiquitousness and its in its in its banality and its everydayness, something that we encounter, you know, on a on a regular basis in our daily lives, exchange with each other and such, such it becomes a per per perfect vehicle for that kind of form for for art to take. Um, um, in addition, the book proposes an alternative economy. 
um, and it, 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 it proposes a, a, actually a real economy as opposed to the fantasy economy of the art world and the high-priced art markets and, and things like that. Is the book is basically the economy of making a book has to do with the production costs, the industrial production costs of the book, the amount that has to go to the distributor, and the amount that has to go to the bookseller, and the amount, uh, and hopefully the artist can garner something out of it. Now, there's something a little bit utopian about this because it uh, doesn't always work that way. Actually, making the economy of book, book production work is a is a real uphill struggle. But there is that possibility. Is that, and that was the interest of a lot of artists also was in a grassroots alternative model to the art market, um, is where the book is based in a real social use value, um, as opposed to the kind of uh, excess value that high art and the such is, is based in. Um, um, and I think also it casts the artist not as the, you know, the genius working off in their garret in their studio and creating masterpieces that somehow emanate from their whateverness, um, but rather the artist becomes uh, you know, uh, an active player in the industrial production of their artwork and that that is, was important to a lot of the artists at the time and hopefully, I think it also is to a new generation of artists who are engaged in all aspects of the bookmaking project from raising the money to how it's printed and, and uh, design, et cetera, and things like that. Um, um, also, the artist book is an alternative space. And I think that um, it, you know, it, it, it's uh, uh, artists used it both out of necessity as out of a out of a way to reach audiences when there wasn't gallery or institutional representation, but also by design, because a lot of the work that these artists were doing were implicitly critiquing those very same um, you know, institutions and, and, and market system. And so it was a perfect you know, form for the book and its you know, ability to, you know, in, in, in a, as an alternative space, to get your book to a public when you don't have gallery representation, but also because your book is critiquing gallery representation. It doesn't need the gallery to, to uh, you know, to, to reach its public. Um, I think also is that the book is alternative space is from kind of the perspective of the, you know, New York avant-garde or something like that where people are grappling with these, you know, you know post-Marxist theories and stuff like that and, and the marketplace and the artist commodity and fetish and stuff like that. In other areas in Eastern Europe and in in Latin America, it was like really serious business. Is that in the Samizdat tradition of you know making banned and censored literature? Um, there also was a rich Samizdat artist book um, where artists who are not willing to go along with the social realist you know mandate of official government culture you know would make their artist books and copy them either by hand or did or mimeograph and circulate them that way. In Latin America, political artists who work both in mail art and in assembling magazines and other forms of publications. There were artists who were basically jailed and tortured and some disappeared um, for their work. So it also, on the one hand, it's yes, interesting alternative art practice. On the other hand, it's real life, life and death politics or can be and can still yet be again if we don't look out. Um, so um, anyway, with that, then let's go to the slideshow. Sorry about that. Um, so that's printed matter storefront. That's Printed Matters Interior. And this, wait, where do, do I press it there? Yeah, there we go. And that's Mel Bachner with his books, um, uh, 1966 piece, Working Drawings and Other Visible Things on Paper Not Necessarily Meant to be Viewed as Art. And it's just, it's just, to me, it's, just a, it's a great illustration of some of the stuff I was talking about. And probably a lot of people know about this project, but it's kind of really exemplary in the relationship between conceptual art and artist books and how the two fit so well together. And uh, he was, Bachner was teaching at SVA at the time, and he was invited to do a show of contemporary drawings. He uh, assembled a bunch of drawings by his different, by colleagues and, and uh, uh, other experimental artists, including uh, Carl Andre, Dan Graham, Eva Hesse, um, uh, Saul LeWitt. And he noted, of course, the technical kind of diagrammatic nature of the, of the drawings and and liked how much they looked like scientific or other kinds of you know, uh, manual type things. And so he invited also engineers, um, uh, biologists, mathematicians to submit works as well. And the story goes is that the school did not have the budget to provide him with frames to hang the pieces on the wall. But the school had just purchased a state-of-the-art Xerox machine for about $50,000 or something that probably took up this much space or something like that. 
And um, so he decided, since he couldn't frame them, to just make uh, four copies of each, of each, of each uh, piece. And he reduced them all to the same size, made four copies each. He alphabetized everyone, mixing in both the artists and the, and the engineers and scientists and mathematicians, and then, um, and then, uh, and then had these four duplicate books um, here um, on pedestals. And that, was, and that was the exhibition. And it's just, again, it's just like, you know, the work works just as well in the book as it does. In fact, it works better in the book than it does on, on a frame on the wall. And someone like, especially like an artist like Lawrence Wiener, the book is the perfect vehicle for his work. You don't need a Lawrence Wiener framed picture on your wall. That's actually antithetical to what he, to the impulse of his work. It should be in book form or poster form or postcard form. Um, um, so anyway, that's, I just wanted to show that as a, as a thing. And there's a close up of one of the books. And there's Solowitz, four basic kinds of line and color. And this, again, is just another um, iconic example um, of just the idea of the artist book. This is not a representation of an artwork. This is the artwork. And typical of Lewitt, it's, you know, anyone could have done this with his instructions. Uh, uh, vertical lines, horizontal lines, diagonal one direction, diagonal the other direction, then all the combinations, add color and then a sampling in the pages of the different colors. And whoops. And this is not a representation of a work. This is the work itself. But it was done a huge edition of like 5,000 copies by Harry Abrams. So the work exists as a unique work 5,000 different times. And I think that's best kind of exemplifies what an artist book um, is or can be. Um, very Small Fires, Ed Ruscha. There's the fire. There's the cigarette it takes to light. And then Bruce Nauman, Burning Small Fires, he takes Ed Ruscha's book and burns it up. And of course, recently at Gagosian Gallery, they had a exhibit of all the different tribute books to Ruscha. There's just been, a printed matter, you just see tons of them. Everyone's redoing the Ruscha books. Um, and this is one of them. Various Fires by, what's his name again? He's Swiss, uh, Thomas Galler. And he has a more contemporary version of not small, but big fires. And um, this is a book um, that Printed Matter published in 1977, Service, a trilogy on colonization by Martha Rossler. And it's, uh, it's actually, it, it, and it is a kind of a, a, a media hybrid because she originally did the book as a mail art project where she wrote these three short novellas on uh, postcards and sent them out to various people. And then this book, the back cover is basically an example of, 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 uh, a re of, of one of the postage things, and then reassembles it into book form. So the, the art project takes different forms of dissemination, going out into multiple places, her assembling them back together, then doing a large editioned artist book out of it. Um, what do we have next? And then this is a book by Telfer Stokes and Helen Douglas, and I forget which one this is. I'm, it might be Fool Scrap, but they were doing, they're just an amazing book artist couple who were working in S London and then Scotland um, starting in the mid 70s. And they're not very well known in the art world, but um, they're really, they're, they're real pioneers and, and a lot of book artists really looked to them for the experimentation that they did. And just as far as like how they, you know, de uh, uh, reference the book, the pages, the surface of the pages, the interaction between the pages and the, and the, the um, the sequencing and stuff. On the left-hand side is a, this is an offset printed book in an edition of about a thousand. On the left-hand side is a is is the print of a stain that was made from the other side of the page, and then on the right-hand hand side is a close-up of a watermark. And so it's these two different representational surfaces that are kind of inverted in this interesting way. And then they also use the book as it's almost like the they use sequencing a lot and building in the pages and cutting into the surfaces um, in different techniques. And then here you see the, the, you know, the plate and then the broken plate with something in it. And their books really read almost like experimental films. Um, and this is the real fiction book I was just showing up. And that's just more example of, again, cutting into the surface of the page, the page being represented. Um, the architecture of the book is then folded into an art interior architectural space and then further collaged. And then they split as an artist team, and Helen Douglas continued to produce these just really lush, sumptuous, um, uh, beautiful books. Um, and actually, we have a couple of these that are in the exhibit. There's a reading 
kind of reading library table in our, exhi in our exhibit, uh, Learn to Read Art, Surviving History, Printed Matter. Um, X Magazine. Um, X Magazine was put out um, in association with the Artist Book Collaborative Projects. Um, and it, I did an exhibition on them that James mentioned in the introduction. And um, I just wanted to bring it up because um, uh, this is like, so the, the, this is a project that Liza Baer did. Liza Baer, one of the co-editors of Avalanche Magazine, she had an organization that she called a Center for New Art Activities. And she did, she solicited major corporate, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, communications industry support to do these very early um, transmissions projects, she called them. And she did this one project called, oh man, what was it called? It was, a, it was like a satellite communication between artists on the West Coast and the East Coast. And then she did this project called Slow Scans. Oh, she did this project called Quips, which was an early version of, of, um, of a fax machine where artists could draw and transmit their, their, their projects over phone lines. And then she did Slow Scans also where, and this is, I think Exxon, like a, an oil goddamn company was like one of the sponsors of this or something. And, um, and what happens with the slow scan is that you take a video image and it gets converted into, a audio into an audio signal. The audio signal gets transferred through the phone lines and then it gets reconverted into a video image on the other end. So you can send these images electronically. It works super slow. Like, like the, it, it would take the video image like several minutes to form. So this is like before the age, but it's very much artists thinking about digital and kind of like boundary ge geography kind of collapsing practices and stuff like that that's so present and everything today. Um, this is more from Liza Bear's thing. But then also I wanted to bring up kind of collab, a collaborative projects because of where they are kind of situated historically and politically. And collab came out of that kind of New York chaos of, of the, the economic collapse of New York in the mid 70s. Collab was formed in the, in, the, in, the, in the late 70s. And it was a time when New York, like basically the Lower East Side, the South Bronx, and, um, and other neighborhoods were literally war zones. They were burned to the, their buildings have been completely burned and gutted. They were very dangerous. Everyone got mugged, everyone got, got burglarized and stuff like that. Um, and this was also the beginning of our current economic recession. This is when wage, uh, wage uh, uh, living standards flattened. This is when the personal debt crisis started. This is when labor was, was started to be uh, pulled apart in the United States. This is when, um, when deregulation started. This is the dawn, this is the post New York economic collapse, pre, pre Reagan, Thatcher um, um, age of austerity, um, which actually we're you know, witnessing now in the current European and American economic crisis. And so I wanted to bring this up because Colab was also an interesting organization because they were, they were not at all like Occupy Wall Street, but there's certain aspects of them because they were, high, they were very chaotic. They were a very uh, 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 rough and tumble um, um, group, but they had certain principles of inclusion and horizont horizontal organization that are actually echoed in the Indignados movement and, and, uh, and Occupy Wall Street movement today is, um, is Colab had a rotating officership where the president and the, and the financial officer and the secretary and all that would rotate on a yearly basis so that power couldn't be concentrated at the top. They had total inclusiveness. Anyone could, anyone could come to a meeting. Once you went to three meetings, you were officially a Colab member and could uh, propose projects to get funding from the Colab war chest. Um, and, and in addition, um, but I think most importantly is they were completely artist driven, is that they took all the different aspects into their own hands they, and, and consciously and as their project. They were nomadic, they didn't have any, any centralized space, but they also, they were the administrators, they were the fundraisers, they were the organizers, they were the curators, they also were the manifesto writers, they also were the critics. And they also were the dealers, because they did these different things called the Amor store, where they sold the artworks themselves. They didn't want, and so they sidestepped all these different you know, specializations that the market is so dependent on for a purely artist-driven um, project, which um, I think is kind of exemplary, and I think also echoes some of the new, kind of the new generation of young artist book publishers who are wanting to take control of their artistic production and how it gets out into the world as well as the kind of economic manufacturing of it as well. So 
That's why I'm bringing up CoLab. This is just like New York, scenic 70s New York. That's like a, 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 a sad murder story. That's, uh, I don't know why the hell I put that in. This is the other X magazine. They were also fascinated with uh, like the urban revolutionary movements, including the Europe, like the Bader Meinhof and stuff. The FALN, the Puerto Rican nationalist group, who there was an association because the Young Lords, which originally had been a Chicago street gang, became politicized and had a very strong presence in New York's Lower East Side. Um, and, but anyway, they kind of had a, um, whatever, artist fascination with real um, uh, militant, militant uh, radicality. Just another asshole. This is just more New York stuff from, from the 70s. Uh, this is put together by, by uh, 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 Barbara S. And, uh, and Glenn Branca. And this particular issue included lots of collab artists. I also think an important thing that, that, that collab was, was kind of networked with a Fashion Moda in the South Bronx, a project of Stefan Eins. And Fashion Moda kind of introduced the early hip hop world to the downtown art scene. And then, and then into the into the into the the East Village galleries, and you know, since then, of course, hip hop has become probably the biggest you know uh, uh, mass culture you know phenomena, aesthetic phenomena, both in music and, and other things um, that you can think of in the last twenty years or you know since then. But but that that it's 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 whatever it had roots in that in that in that scene. Um, this is a book. Um, called Larry by the artist Eva Maria Weinmeier. And it's basically a documentation of a project she did, and I think it's an interesting kind of experimental media project, we can call it. And it's called Larry because if you open up the book in the front and the back of the book, the title of the it's actually the letterhead of Rosamund Felsen Gallery in Santa Monica. And what Eva Maria did was she posed, I'm going to skip forward, she posed as a collector who was very interested in this Bruce Nauman print. And this is all done by fax between her and the gallery. This is back in the day of faxes. And so she approached the gallery and she said, well, I'd be interested in purchasing one of these prints by Bruce Nauman. Can you please you know, fax, fax them over um, for me so I can you know, consider it at, at, at length? And so the gallery faxed over the print. Here's a copy of the fax. And so then Eva Maria writes back to the gallery and says, you know, as I was watching the, the fax come out of the fax machine, I was thinking, this is really a fascinating process where the, where the, the piece has been dematerialized and turned into audio signals and then sent over the phone lines and then magically reappears in my apartment. And this is just an, an astounding kind of commentary on, on media and book. And I actually find the fax piece much more interesting than the original work where I'm torn between which one. And um, can you tell me how much you'd like to, you know, charge me for the fax piece, because I'd like to keep that as the, my Nauman piece of set. And the gallery writes back right away and says, oh, no, 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 That's, we cannot charge you anything. It is not a, uh, cannot be considered an artwork by, by Nauman by any means, and cease and desist, and blah, blah, blah. And then she writes back and says, in fact, I like the fax piece better. I'm going to keep it as my Nauman work, and I'm going to make a book out of this, and I'll give you half the edition. And that's what she did. She made this artist book in an edition of 1,000 and sent 500 to the gallery. And, I don't know what happened to the 500 that went to the gallery, but we've been happily selling them for the last bunch of years. Um, so that's that book. This is just, this is the artist David Thorne. I just wanted, this is like the most simple kind of artist book you can make. And I think like the accessibility of the artist, of, of artist book and the simplicity of the technology is one of the, uh, is one of the attractions of young artists to it. And this is basically a folded piece of paper with one cut in it. And uh, Thorne started doing his Men in the, Net in the News series during the first Persian Gulf War, where he would simply take um, uh, 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 different portions of, the, of, of all the mili military images coming out in the New York Times and, and, and put them into this kind of collage of found, really just found art, random found, found stuff. And then he started being, constructing them more carefully. But um, at any rate, um, um, that's a, uh, how the book functions as a, as a book, and that's the actual structure. You just make a slit through the middle of it, you fold it a certain way, and you fold it the right way, and then it becomes a book with turnable pages. No binding, no nothing uh, involved, so anyone can be a book artist. On the other end, we have the Holy Bible, Old Testament by David Hammonds, and this thing is about that big, and it weighs about 20 pounds, 10, 15 kilograms. It's massive, and it has gilded edges and it weighs a ton and it's leather bound and um, in the interior it's basically just a found catalog resume of the complete works of Marcel Duchamp so of course it's a wry Hammonds-esque comment on 
the kind of maybe the canonization and fetishization of Duchamp, who of course people always cite as the anti-canonical, anti-fetishizing force behind that drives the entire contemporary art landscape. Anyway, on to um, Don Quixote by the artist Gareth Long. And this is an interesting kind of media experiment in which he took a recent translation of Don Quixote and he got the books on tape version and he played the books on tape version to one of those voice decoders or whatever it's called, those voice things. And so it, the machine, the computer, listened to the books on tape thing and then phonetically transcribed the, the, the contents of the entire book. And then all 578 pages or whatever it is um, in complete barely readable phonetic handwriting and Don Quixote doesn't come up once it just couldn't couldn't understand Don Quixote um, and then there's how to disappear in America and this is another interesting intermedia project by the artist Seth Price and what he did is there's this text how to disappear in America that says it's a it's a, it's a text that's circulated in kind of survivalist and anarchist and underground um, both left and right communities and there used to be this bookstore in Midtown Manhattan called Sky Books that was awesome and it was basically like a, a soldier of fortune survivalist place but they also had like rad you get anarchist cook, cookbook and stuff like that there they had all this really creepy like you know how to go to you know different parts of the world and kill or be killed or whatever but it also had how to disappear without a trace and stuff and so this book, and it used to circulate as a zine, as a photocopied zine, and people would do different translations or add and subtract information. And that even accelerated on the internet. And Seth Price took a version of it and basically just put his name on it and redid it. As, and it's very instructive. Maybe we should all get hand copies of it now. Oops. But I also wanted to say is that um, another artist, what's her name? Um, Suzanne Berner, a German artist, she did the exact same project. Um, and I think unknowns to Seth, she might have even done it before him, but she did How to Disappear in America Without a Trace, working from the same text with the exact same idea. She did it in a bit smaller paperback, more of a good portable thing that you can stick in your back pocket so when you're on the run, you know, you have somewhere to pick it and then you can figure out how to siphon gasoline and fake your own death and, and make a Molotov cocktail um, whenever you needed to at the spur of the moment. Um, but so she did that, and she also did, a, she also did a residency in China where she spoke with local, um, during the course of her several month residency, she spoke with lo locals, and they have a very, very uh, astute you know, uh, uh, knowledge and, and, and uh, shared you know, information of ways that you can evade the, you know, the, the, the state apparatus. Um, and so she made a Chinese version of how to disappear in China without a trace, which I thought was interesting. Another translation, the artist, Sean Patrick Carney, who also is, um, uh, works in stand-up comedy, he, uh, he, he's translated these you know, iconic uh, theoretical and art texts into uh, American. So he you know, does it in a vernacular form, plenty of swear words, very easy to understand. You get the gist of it anyway. Those are at the booth too, if you want to, in our reading library. Um, just different forms and structures. We still kind of in the book arts field, we're happy to carry sandpaper, die cut, uh, bubble wrap, and, and, and screen. These are by the artist David Stairs. And The Field Guide to Weeds, one of our most popular printed matter books, one of the ones we publish by Kim Beck with, fee with weeds growing up out of the gutter and eventually taking over the whole page. Um, so now we get to Swill Children. And Swill Children is, is um, one of these uh, new generation artist books. The, the, the people who are in this community of, of, of bookmakers, they also work in audio, performance, and other things. They're all probably between the ages of like 19 and 24, or something like that. And they do um, risograph books. And um, the Swill Children, the name is based, Swill Children is what the roaming bands of orphans during the Industrial Revolution who, um, who traded chicken, uh, kitchen refuse um, for fertilizer and hog food. And, um, and, and their general operating concept is that the idea of value is a variable and that their projects are based on that fundamental co concept. Um, they work in, now, now the, th the reason why I want to bring them up really is because, is that this is like this new generation of kids who are like really into artist books. And if you go to the I Never Read show, you're going to see a whole bunch of them, young people making books. And I guess the question is, um, you know, 
well, well, first of all, let me talk about like the demise of the publishing industry. Everyone's talking about the demise of the publishing industry, the publishing uh, ebooks and all this kind of stuff. And ebooks is you know cutting into publishing. We're talking about big mass, you know, multi, you know, hundreds of thousands editions being made. And ebooks is cutting in, but uh, different kind of industry analysts are saying there's a certain percentage that it's going to flatten out, about 30 percent that it'll take away from 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 the book market. The real in, uh, the real the real crisis in the publishing industry is actually the financial collapse of, of, ni of 2007, 2008, where, um, where the bottom line is greatly affected. They gotta, still got to make a profit. And the way that they make that profit is through further monopolizing these big media conglomerates and also by consolidating the number of books that they're publishing, is that they're, they're, they're letting go of the, of the risks and stuff like that, and a smaller number of titles are currently in the process of being published. And I think that goes a long way to explaining what we really are seeing as a resurgence in independent publishing, which also we definitely see in the artist book community, as well as independent bookstores. You'll even know, I know in America, I'm not sure if in Europe, is that people are just sick and tired of the, you know, the homogenization and the McDonaldization of goddamn publishing and people and going to the, you know, going to the, the, those chain bookstores and stuff and are seeking out independent bookstores and things that are that just have a more you know access and interest and specialization and that obviously have a have a have a closer economic relationship to to you know to the to the citizen not just consumer um, um, so so I, and I see that this this you know this uh, this independent artist book publishing happening within this larger context, I guess I would say. And one of the things that I always wonder about with like what they're, these are printed on Resograph and Resograph is a, it's widely popular. You'll probably see a lot of them that I never read if you go to the, if you go to that fair. Widely popular among young publishers. It's a form of, it's a digital form of mimeograph printing. And mimeograph printing is that, you know, with a piece of carbon paper and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 acetone or something like that. It, it only lasts for about 100 copies. It's what we used to get the school papers with. It was printed in blue. You could sniff it and think you'd get high and stuff like that. But, um, but this is a digital form of that that uses the same thing, but it can be made in large editions and can be made relatively cheap, whether you do it in a small edition or a large edition. So it has kind of a faded and nostalgic, almost old-fashioned look. And so it immediately made the alarm bells go off in my head and wondering if, that, if this is kind of like if these young artists, this is kind of like a, a, a nostalgic recuperation of a past that they never experienced. And so they're just kind of like going back to like this, you know, this iconic time that they've seen images of and stuff. Or do they have a real interest in situating themselves, you know, in the present and in the current, our current moment in history? Um, and the thing is that I, the thing to remember is that this new generation is these guys, and maybe some of you guys out there were, if you're in that age group, were they were acquiring language at the same time that they were learning how to do the keyboards. And this is really the first generation that is accessing both, both computer literacy, three, oh shit, three uh, minutes left, computer literacy and actual speaking communication at the same time. So my argument is that these people are very, I mean, they're not, this isn't some kind of Luddite reactionary return to the object fetish, blah, 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 is that there's a need for physical object and for the community that physical, physical objects require. The collaboration, a lot of these done, are done collaboratively. They're done collaboratively in the internet via social media and email and communications in putting projects together. And they're done physically in meeting. And then there is the physical as aspect of the actual book production and then getting it out into the world, the community of exchange and selling and that alternative economy that I talked about before. And I think that this is really is mirrored by the kind of the phenomena of the global uprising against the neoliberal order, which we see in Tahrir Square and Occupy Wall Street and Los Indignados in Spain, um, of where the, um, the people are utilizing the available digital technologies to, to whatever effect they can and to use it as needed to organize and resist and intervene. Um, but that, that the, 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 the digital space, the media space, cannot replace the physical space and the physical community. And so the physical intervention, the physical opposition is something that's needed as well. And I think that's mirrored partly in the activity of, uh, activities of these young artists. And I guess also to close is that 
you know, uh, to go back to the, the, the digital utopian I was talking about in the beginning, is that in, during the uprising in Egypt, when um, uh, the, 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 the internet was highly, highly censored and people could not communicate by internet anymore. And especially, and we see in recent events in America where you see the convergence of a national security state with a technological surveillance state, that free communication that that guru talked about is not a given, it's not inevitable, and it's not natural. It's something that happens to be here, but it is part of a broader you know, social political uh, context and struggle, I would say, that is going on. And so I think that um, the book as a physical object is something that's not going away, and uh, we might be uh, coming to need it more <laughs> as we go forward in the future. So that's um, the contents of Swill Children. Um, Ryan Forster, these zines he sells for 50 cents. He does them in, in great quantities, really uh, got a great zine sensibility. Artist book sensibility, does them on newsprint. Um, Neves from Switzerland, who I really think are one of the banner, the, you know, they really were at the forefront of, of, a, of a new generation of interest in artist book and publishing. I wanted to do a whole rap about zines and what the, the kind of what a zine was and what it is and what it can be, but I don't think there's time for that. I'll just scroll through these. Um, Grill Girls Art Museum activity book, also about how to intervene physically in the space of the museum or in the space of official culture um, and doing it through a handy handbook. It also could be, that information could be transmitted online too, I guess. Um, uh, uh, Fierce Pussy, these were poster projects that they did back in the 90s. These were all over downtown New York. They turned it into a book uh, 20 years to 15 years later, and they encourage you to photocopy them and um, rehang them on the wall. So you have another generation, Absence by Mi Jin Yoon. After reasonable research, all the wars from the year zero to the year 2000, and she's passing the project on after she dies for someone to continue the research. Um, that book folds out into about, it goes longer than this thing, and it's two columns long. But anyway, on the hopeful note, Artist books are not going away. They're making a comeback. And um, come to our booth, and thank you very much. That's it. <laughs>